certainly had slavery since the settlement of the island. So 1659, the first people that came in were some settlers with slaves. And slavery lasted until 18, approximately 1834, and it was finally made illegal in 1839 on St. Lena. But then one year later, a ship shows up at Lemon Valley. The island barely has any idea what it's about, why it's come here. I think they had a few days notice to prepare. And this ship was full of um, African slaves or now freed slaves, um, liberated Africans. And so that began, that begins the start of this period of, of St. Lena's history in becoming involved with the suppression of the slave trade. For, and that took about 30 years um, from 1840 to about 1870. So Lemon Valley was the start. After a few years, they realized that this valley was gonna be way too small. And so everything moved to Rupert's, which was at the time completely unoccupied. You, might, you had the wall across the valley. There may have been a few soldiers just positioned here on watch duty, but nobody lived here. Um, we had none of the stuff behind the walls, just a few shacks and, and garrison buildings. So they were coming in to Rupert's in ships, but where were they coming from? So if, if you want to get closer, um, I've just got a map of the South Atlantic. So there's South America, Africa, and St. Lena in the middle. Um, the arrows represent the ocean currents. The black, well, the black arrows represent like shipping routes. So they were going clockwise, was that anti-clockwise, round. So St. Lena was a perfect position to bring people or ships that had been captured. So they were being um, captured along the, the West African coast and taken mainly to Brazil and later Cuba. And this was after Britain had abolished the slave trade throughout the empire. This is after most countries had abolished the slave trade. Brazil was still illegally practicing slavery. Cuba was still illegally practicing slavery. So they needed slaves from somewhere. Um, and there were people basically sailing around, capturing slaves from, or buying slaves from the coasts and bringing them across. So Britain stationed the West African squadron at St. Lena and Freetown. They then just patrolled the ocean and captured ships um, to bring them here. I've got another map that shows us each dot represents a point that a ship was captured. So you see the majority are around this area of West Africa, also up here. Um, this, is, this roughly corresponds to today's nations of Angola and the Congo, um, but then it, was a, it wasn't a united I think Portugal had control of various ports along the coast, but inland there were various different African kingdoms and tribes that made up sort of a patchwork of, of different nations. So it's not to say that the slaves were all coming exactly from these points. They may have come from inland and been brought to the coast to be sold and traded. So St. Lino, there was a few captured around the ocean and a few around in um, Brazil as well. So. Um, the arrival of a, a ship at St. Lena was massive. Um, the population at the time was three to 4,000. Um, a ship could be carrying anywhere up to 1,000 people. So an arrival meant you know, a huge increase in population, stuffing them all into Rupert's and trying to deal with them in, in some kind of way. So I've, I've got um, a passage written by uh, Mellis in 1861. He actually was in Rupert's. He was the engineer on the island at the time, so he was looking into how to um, build up the liberated African establishment and make it better. And he actually visited one of the slave ships when it arrived. Um, so we're just going to, I'm just going to read this out. So he says, a visit to a full freighted slave ship arriving at St. Lena is not easily to be forgotten. A scene so intensified in all that is horrible that it almost defies description. The vessel, scarcely a hundred tons burthen at most, contains perhaps little short of a thousand souls, which have been closely packed for many weeks together in the hottest and most polluted of atmospheres. I went on board one of these ships as she cast anchor off Rupert's Valley in 1861, and the whole deck, as I picked my way from end to end, in order to avoid treading on them, was thickly strewn with the dead, dying, and starved bodies of what seemed to me to be a species of ape that I had never seen before. 
one's sensations of horror were lessened by the impossibility of realizing that the miserable, helpless objects being picked up from the deck and handed over the ship's side one by one, living, dying, and dead alike, were really human beings. Their arms and legs were worn down to about the size of a walking stick, and many died as they passed from the ship to the boat. Indeed, the work of unloading had to be proceeded with so quickly that there was no time to separate the dead from the living. So that, that just gives us an idea of what is taking place in Rupert's at this time. Okay? So we're going to move through now onto the other side of the wall and we're going to just talk about the liberated Afghan establishment itself. best if we could just go over there. So a big, um, one of the questions I always ask, one of the themes I try and pick up on a lot is like, who were the liberated Africans? We, honestly, we don't know much about them. We don't know exactly where they came from. We don't know what languages they spoke. We don't know we, we only know what, um, what they found out by studying the 325 remains that were excavated, um, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about as we go up the valley, but it's always something worth keeping in your mind, just like who these people were and how we can give them like, their story back, basically. Um, so <clears throat> Rupert's today is completely unrecognizable from how it was back then. If you imagine this area just completely flat and empty and like I said, when they arrived, it was this sort of emergency situation. You've got 1,000 people coming in. They needed to build somewhere for them to live, hospital, for them to cook food. And so they, they created what was then known as the Liberated African Depot. And um, you, you'll be able to see there, there's the wall as it was back then. And behind that, we have lots of tents. Basically, they are tents. These were tents made up from the ships that they came in on, from wood and sail. And um, that's all they could do at the time uh, for the liberated Africans to provide them with accommodation. Uh, a, a theme, that, again, that recurs throughout this um, talk will be that the Britain, back in the UK, the government, basically didn't provide any support or very little support. And when they did provide it, it was too late. Um, so they had to make do with this, this setup for pretty much the whole 20 to 30 years that they were in. And, and it wasn't just the same lot that came in once, it was a thousand people each time, 500 to a thousand people each time. And then they would leave and then another lot would come in and they would all be living in the same tents and living in the same sort of accommodation that, that you see here. So over time it gets worse and worse, termites eat the tents down and they've got nowhere to shelter and it's just, it's just horrible. So again, another, um, there's a photograph, actually there's another drawing there just showing a bit closer, the tents. Imagine the heat now and like living in these tents with this it's just canvas basically over the top and the sun beating down on it. And um, here's an actual photograph um, with the tents and then the, you just see some figures there lined up in front of them and that's actually some liberated Africans just after they've arrived on St. Helena. So that the arrival we've learned about slavery in school and how like slaves were bought and sold at markets and how they're sort of lined up their ages are taken male or female teeth are checked you know to check how strong they are and this this kind of thing actually happened even though they were being freed it was like they were checking them for their health where they come from what um male or female and so it's like this really dehuman dehumanizing process that was just constantly taking place and the Europeans at the time that were here doing this, they just didn't understand like what's wrong with it. You know, we're freeing you, we're, we're doing you a favor. Um, but it was, the Africans, as you can imagine, were not happy. Um, so yeah, they're lined up, they're tallied basically, and then given identification tags to say whether they're sick, male or female, and so on. And there's also another, this is, um, again, they're all sort of sitting down being brought to attention and these are a bunch of Europeans and they're actually um, preachers they're preaching to them trying to convert them to Christianity where they come from they probably they didn't ever had never heard of Christianity before 
Um, so they're being basically forcibly converted um, to save them. Um, and so, yeah, this, this process was, was horrible from start to finish for them. Um, and the Europeans thought, you know, yeah, like, uh, should be, you should be grateful, but obviously weren't. Um, because it was just so horrible. It's sort of un you, can't, you can't imagine, but I'm trying to get you to, a, to try and put yourself in their situation. So uh, we're going to move on further up the valley. We're actually going to the last building, the only thing that's left from the liberated African establishment. As soon as they identified someone as being sick, they could bring them straight here and they could get treatment or just let them recover, or in many cases, unfortunately, just, just let them die. Um, but keeping the disease or keeping the illness from spreading to those that were still healthy. So um, I, I also said at the start that Britain was really bad at supporting this endeavor. Um, they were constantly sending letters asking for money, like, look, you know, can you imagine now, um, this is a time when the island's just lost its um, sort of, basically its, its um, carer in the East India Company, who was just pumping in money to the island to keep it going, and is now um, run by the Crown, but the Crown, they don't really care about the island anymore because shipping is now going the other way, it's going up the Suez Canal, and so they're like, well, why should we give you money? Um, and it was only until like scandals happened, like 400 out of 500 people might have died off a ship, and, and they were like, why is this happening? You know, what are you doing? And they're like, well, you're not giving us money. So eventually in, 18, in about the 1860s, they did give some money and it was going towards building this. But by that point, the actual, the, the slaves coming in or the liberated Africans coming in had already started to drop off considerably. So it's too late. Like they needed this hospital from the start, um, but it wasn't built until about 20 years into the whole endeavor. So it's just um, uh, an all round failing basically. But it is the last representation of, of this. So, <laughs> so we hope that in not, not too distant future, this building can become a, an interpretation center or a museum um, towards this story of, of, on St. Lena, like dedicated to the liberated Africans, then dedicated to telling their story to make sure it's not forgotten. I just wanted to talk some of the nastier sides of, of this as well. Um, again, we come back to the Europeans and what they were doing. So the doctors were all European. Um, they didn't have a clue how to treat half the diseases that these people were suffering from. Um, it was mainly dysentery and um, various other diseases that come from Africa that they didn't have medicines for. Um, so they tried all kinds of crazy methods and a lot of um, experiments and things on the liberated Africans. For many doctors that were working here, it was a chance to sort of further their CV. If you can imagine a doctor coming out today, they want to do loads of good surgeries or treat loads of people to make themselves look better. And this was happening here. So a big thing at the time in the Victorian times was uh, the practice of um, like dissection and post-mortems on the body. So they were doing all kinds of stuff um, like craniotomies, so cutting the tops of the heads off to try and study their, their brains to see if they think differently from us, to see if, they, if anything in their brain is an indicator on why they're ill. And um, unfortunately this was just a fact of the time, it wasn't just on St. Lena, it was going on around the world. But it just so happened that the liberated Africans represented to the doctors sort of a fresh supply of bodies and experimental uh, case, uh, people they could use. Um, so this is number one building across the valley, I think behind these warehouses, and it's something that I'll be working on in the coming months when they start building the new port um, was a um, another building number two building made from wood there was a store there was uh, various other buildings there's also a place called the dead house so it's probably where they put all these experiments and bits of people's bodies um, they just threw them into this sort of little shed um, so it's something we're gonna have to look out for when they go digging around there if they can if they find anything like that um, other things, so, um, well, as we walk up the valley, we'll talk about how the liberated Africans, what kind of legacy, what else they left on the island. Um, things like the run, not as it is today, but they probably dug the original channel. 
They weren't paid for this. They were made to do it. Paytown House, probably built by the liberated Africans. Elsewhere on the island, the, the cathedral, St. Paul's, was built by liberated Africans. They, they were made to carry a stone from town or wherever they got the stone from, all the way up to St. Paul's. And again, they weren't paid for this. They were basically forced into this work. So another theme that will run through this is that they were not really free. They were not liberated, but we call them that. Um, so they were, yeah, they were seen as a free source of labor, a free source of experiment and, and just something else, something other than us that we could treat them how we wanted to because you know we've done them a favor or something like that. So we're going to move up the valley away from the chainsaw now. <laughs> Do have anything else? Oh, um, there's some, there, there is some pictures. So this is a craniotomy patient that they've taken the top of the skull off. This is a charnel pit. So this is the kind of thing, um, once they were done with bits of bones, mainly the skulls and the femur, which is the like longest bone in your body. And that's what they were looking at. So they were just dumped in a big pit. And, you know, we don't know much about their burial beliefs, but um, I think it's pretty safe to say that like the idea of separating bits of your body off from other, you know, from, from your main body and then burying it somewhere else to the rest of your body is like pretty abhorrent. Um, and there's actually a body um, they found in one of the graves without head. So it, they just cut the head off and uh, buried the rest of the body. Um, yeah. Sorry, if you didn't hear me before, the run was dug, originally dug by the liberated Africans. Now it's been concreted in and everything, but the channel, the original channel was probably dug by liberated Africans to divert the water down the middle of the valley. Yeah, so there's a map there drawn again by Mellis, the guy who I mentioned earlier. He was charged in about 1862, 1861, with um, alleviating like the pressure of housing in Jamestown they decided they would build a new town in Rupert's. So Haytown, and then a few of the um, other stone buildings you see up on the left were all part of this attempt. So he went through, he divided it all up into like different plots. He also marked the two graveyards and the liberated African establishment as it was still going then. So they attempted to try and populate Rupert's and, and take some of the people out of Jamestown. But it just failed. I, th I think people didn't really want to live around here. Um, there was mass emigration from the island because the island was so poor at that time, so a lot of people were leaving for Australia and Cape Town, places like that, just to get away from the poverty. So in the end, it, it was just aborted. But it was, yeah, it's a residence. And you can see, I think it says 1862 on there, yeah. It was named after a governor at that time called Governor Hay. Yeah, like, so these buildings, these four, I think, from the historic Haytown development. We're not sure the way the roof is so close to the top of the windows that they might have been two-story at one point. Maybe a wooden upper, and, and that was destroyed by termites. Um, so, yeah, like, so like Helena was saying, this, um, this is one of the burial grounds. This is the lower burial ground. Um, again, Mellis had marked it as African Graveyard A. Um, and I think this is probably the first bit of land they started to use. People like, often ask why, you know, they only find bones really here and then further up. Because Rupert's is so dry and rocky, <coughs> land is really hard to, to bury people in here. And um, eventually, actually, the two graveyards were full up and they had to start burying people. Um, it's like Half Tree Hollow 
And if you know Hofstra Hollow, there's like an area which is now a playground, and it's, it used to be called Old Churchyard, I think. And that was a burial ground for liberated Africans as well. Um, so yeah, the lower um, cemetery, um, which Andy Pearson, I think he, he studied and he identified exactly like the extent of it extends, so probably underneath this house um, and all the way up to the edge of the road um, up there. Um, there's not been really many invasive studies. I, it's just something that doesn't need to be done or, or nobody wants to do because it would just disturb um, burials. But I think one of the key things is to, um, things like planting the hibiscus and just generally demarcating it and recognizing it, it as a proper burial ground as, as best as we can um, to give these people the respect that they didn't get um, in life and then uh, shortly after they died. So it's just about making ourselves aware of this and remembering. Um, but, so they did, so Andy, um, if you want to have a look, um, this is the part, so I'm going to start going into like looking at the more modern studies, but it will be a lot more like skeletal remains. So if you're not comfortable, um, I, w I will just let you know now that there will be a lot more things on display that you might not like. So this is a trench they dug just sort of behind this tree here. You see the bridge, it's still there. Um, and they just scraped the, the ground. And you see it's barely a, a, more than a foot deep. And just here where the red and white pole is, that's I think two skeletons there um, lied out in the ground. And this was just covered up again, so they didn't remove these, but they just wanted to make absolute sure that this was definitely a burial ground. And so based on that, yeah, I think you know, it's pretty inconclusive that this area is probably full of, of burials. Um, not the kind of burials that we would expect if we died now, not like laid out neatly with headstones. Um, um, you know, we talked about how they were if they were ill or dying, they were isolated out and they were taken away and put into the hospital. And then if they died, they were instantly taken up here. And because Mampal was so low, there was nobody really to do it. It's liberated Africans burying their own dead um, as well. And having to do that quickly to stop the spread of disease. So you get many cases where bodies are just thrown in the ground, not very deep. Um, maybe rocks are put on top to stop dogs coming around and digging them up. Um, and, and you can see, as we go through, you'll see by the different body poses and, and the way they're laying in the graves that it was just done hastily and, and without care, which is no, no fault of the liberated Africans. It was just what they had to do at the time. Um, so it's, you know, there was no alternative. So, so yeah. Question, how, many how many bodies are buried here? Or yeah, I ha sorry, I haven't them? mentioned any figures, have I? Um, so we think from, from the period 1840 to 1870, it was approximately 30,000 people brought into the island. That includes Lemma Valley, I think, as well. Um, and then out of that, about a third. But it's, it's, there's no exact figure. It's impossible. Without, um, there's no re there were no records kept of that kind of thing. Um, there were, without digging up all the graves and counting, it's not going to be possible. Um, but I think it's anywhere between eight and 10,000, possibly even more. Um, which is a huge number for such a, uh, you know, I think the size of Rupert, think of the population of St. Lena. Um, so, you know, it could be uh, a third or so in this graveyard and then the rest in the upper and then a few uh, around the island elsewhere. Um, so the rest of the 20,000, they did move on and we'll talk about that when we get up there. But um, about 10, I always say about 10,000 were buried in Rupert's or Rupert's and Lemon Valley, yeah. And I think that's another important thing. We need to recognize um, Lemon Valley as well. I think we need to get something eventually around there, some kind of signage or demarcation of the burial ground. We think if you're interested, if you, if you know Lemon Valley, if you go quite, quite a way up the valley, um, there's a ruined cottage and that was the doctor, that's where the doctor and the sort of the lead, the, the head of that establishment stayed. And uh, below there in sort of the, the valley itself was where the graveyard is just grown up with cactuses and stuff now. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, so we're just, we're gonna move on to like the last few points now. Um, we're gonna go right up to the, the old jail opposite the power station.
So yeah, this, so this, yeah, so this is the upper burial ground, um, the second of the two, and it was just another area that they they really like, like identified they could bury people in. The burial was probably extended from that side of the valley where the power station is, all the way up to where the pipeline is. I think they actually found some more bones when they built this pipeline um, in the last few years, which were added to the 325 that were already excavated. And it possibly extends all the way up the valley here. If you see these white stones and the little money plant trees growing along them, that's supposed to demarcate the burial ground. So all of this flat area, we don't, we don't know for sure. Um, it, was, it is quite prone to flooding, um, but it could potentially contain lots and lots of burials. Um, again, it's just something that's not going to be, not just going to dig it up just for the sake of it, but hopefully all development will, is not allowed on these sites so that they don't go building things and, and digging up more bones. So the, the, I talk about the, the burials again, we've already talked about how they were buried. Um, I was saying before, they were carried from the hospital when they died. In many cases, maybe they weren't even dead. Maybe they were in a coma, or, and, and there was today there'd still be hope. But back then there was no hope, so they just had to move the bodies into the burial sites as quickly as possible. The liberated Africans that were still healthy and alive were the ones doing this. Um, the dead may have just been laid out on sheets, and they'd come along with some poles, lift the sheets up, and just tip the body into this pre-dug grave. Again, it was the liberated Africans digging the graves, and just dump them in take the sheet back, get the next one, do it again. And as you see, the, the sort of the haphazard way, I mean, we expect to be laid straight out, um, generally facing, I think, east, um, our heads facing east. And um, just, they didn't have any clothes on or anything, like they didn't have much items with them. Um, so they were just thrown in the ground and forgotten. Um, just had to be done. Again, there's a, a picture here. I'm not sure if this is a mother and a, a child, maybe, buried. Um, this is where I want to start to talk about who, who, the, who are the liberated Africans. And it's through the study of these 325 that are still in the pipe store in Jamestown that studies have been done, studies have been done on their teeth, studies have been done on their bones, to try and work out ages, gender, where they came from. It's not always been successful. Um, but I, I, I know they have worked out through these, the teeth, isotopes in the teeth, um, that they can provide a general geographic area of this, if we think back to the start, that area of sort of West Central Africa, a really large range. They can't pinpoint exactly where they came from and likely never will. So, you know, they, these people, they had this taken away from them. They couldn't get back. They couldn't talk English, they can articulate where they came from. The idea of like, it's hard for us to think, you know, we, we know all about the world and how big it is, and that's all been discovered. But for these people, they may have never ever left their home in Africa. So for them to come to this strange island, being taken away from their family and friends, and then trying to, just trying to understand what, what on earth is going on. Like, why have I been seized and taken on this ship? Um, and now just cast aside in this valley. So, and here's another burial. And so the ages, um, a clue, it might be in the footprints, you see around the graves of the archeologists that were adults that were doing the dig. You see um, next to the leg bone, these people were, we think about, well, over 50% of them were I think under the age of 14. Um, I think the, the majority of those were between the ages of nine and 12. Um, this was like the prime age for taking someone as a slave. So you could essentially breed them into it, ed teach them to be an obedient slave. And you know, if you capture an adult, they're probably gonna resist. There were adults, um, I think, yeah, maybe like 20 to 30% sort of, um, late teens up to about 30 um, but over half the majority like up to 14 some and and there were newborns as well and babies as well in in the liberated african um, establishment again just an idea of arms kind of just you know that's been thrown in these graves um, all over the place 
So yeah, I, I just these are so yeah. Uh, age at death, um, oh, almost half, nine to twelve years. Um, it's really hard at that age to determine whether someone's male or female because they've yet to their body's yet to undergo. You know, just from looking at the skeleton, your body's yet to undergo uh, changes which uh, differentiate between men and women. So. Mm only really adults and you can see that the majority of the adults way way um, more men than women in, in the liberated African depot um, again men being more ideal stronger um, more useful as a slave than a woman at that time um, so yeah and then to um, also the, the the teeth were studied to try and identify some traits that may um, help us work out where they came from. Um, loads of them had dental modification, um, which I think the most common one was was what, like one of these. But it was it was a way of identifying people from different tribes, different ethnicities. We kind of we might tend to view as they certainly did back then that, that all Africans were the same. That they didn't think, oh, this African from this place might be different to this African, even though they're, they're quite close together. They speak different languages. They come from different ethnic backgrounds, just like people in Europe do. Um, but it's, it's just that, that colonial mentality back then, racist mentality, that they thought they're all the same. So it's only now that we can actually study them with uh, more advanced science and try and give them like that back, like. Um, a personality, a story. So, um, yeah, that's the study into the teeth. Um, and again, I talked about not just bodies being buried in these sites as well, but also um, I think there was up to 50 different variety of, of bead, mostly glass beads, um, some ceramic, some animal um, bone. And um, these came actually came mostly from Europe, um, so they were made in Venice. They were traded to the African people um, for various goods that you could only get in Africa, like ivory and gold and um, various other products, and slaves themselves. So uh, many, I, th I think only out of the three to five, only um, 20 or so actually were buried with items, which, which again might give us a clue about, like after they died, they maybe had the themselves stripped down, um, clothes taken, people needed the clothes, and the beads were probably valuable, they could have used them as bartering chips and things like that. Um, so this one, this is the, la this is the la last picture of a, a, a burial, this is actually a, a burial of a newborn baby, and it's one of four burials in the whole of the 325 that were buried with a coffin. The other, t other two were also newborn babies, one was an adult, and we don't know why, but we, we think because that they were given a coffin that that was a sign that they were more important. Maybe the, the, the child of a, one of the leaders, one of the chiefs in, in the, uh, here at the time. Um, but also, if you think back to the demographics, there's mainly men here, mainly young children. The, the birth of a newborn was, was like a huge event, like it rarely ever happened. So unfortunately, due to the health conditions at the time, not many of these children survived. Um, so it was like obviously a huge event. And this is actually a display. We've got this, um, not, not the skeleton, but the, the layout of the grave and the coffin and all the things that this child was buried with. Like um, underneath there was a, a mattress of beads, these glass beads, about 4,000, and various different items that whoever this child belonged to or the people um, from the liberated African had buried with this child. Um, this is just a picture to give you an idea of the size. This this man excavating it. Yeah. It, it, the ones the, the liberated Africans that did, survived, um, they were they were moved on, so they couldn't all stay here. We do know that about 500, four five hundred did stay on Saint Lena, and it was hard for them here. As I mentioned, the island was in a state of poverty. Um, they were. It was like difficult for them to fit into St. Ninian society because they were so different. They had very dark skin. As I mentioned, they had this dental modification. Some had actual scarification on their faces, done purposefully, to, again, to mark them out from different tribes they came from. So they, they found it really hard, and many 
I think they ended up leaving. But the rest, they went to places around the British Empire, um, Guyana, and various different Caribbean islands. Um, some went back to Cape Town, some went to Freetown and Sierra Leone. Um, I say back to Cape Town, um, some just went to Cape Town. Um, but it, it didn't get much better for them from here. It wasn't like, oh, suddenly you're free, you can go on and live a normal life. As we talked about, they've, they've lost everything. They've had their entire like, identity stripped away from them. And so they were forcibly moved on. They didn't have a choice. The voyage, um, they were given money to pay the voyage, but they had to then pay that money back when they got to these places by working. So it was like a form of indentured servitude. Um, so in many ways, yeah, they were not actually ever free. Um, so they, they couldn't go back. They didn't know where they came from. Um, so yeah, it was just a tough time all round. Um, I mean, yeah, there's some figures there of different numbers. So like, this is only between 1840 and 1849, but 15,000 um, were emigrated out of St. Lena and onto different places. Oops. Known image we have of the liberated Africans that stayed on St. Lena. So it's, there's five individuals, there's three ladies, two men. Um, this, this was taken about 1900. So we think at this point they're about 70, in their 70s. So they probably were, were some of the first liberated Africans to come on to the island and stay here. Uh, so they've lived, uh, hopefully integrated in St. Lena's society. But this is them in the poorhouse. So they've, they've reached old age. They didn't have, you know, the island was in poverty at the time. Um, and, and so they, they lived out their life. But it's just a nice image we have of them, just to give them some kind of, you know, personalised something back, something we can recognise them by. Plan last year, which has been endorsed by um, St. Lynn's Council, um, and hopefully this is now um, funding permitted, moving towards memorialising and getting the 325 reburied in Rupert's and just recognising this history again. I mentioned the, um, the building down there, turning that into an interpretation centre. So hopefully, um, in the next few years, I'd say.